So in the last video I did, I got this comment which got me interested into creating this video as a whole discussion. It said that in your business, why not just simply create an EC2 instance for backend and connect it to Postgres. With the endpoint call, regular Lambda is very expensive. It has some truth to it, but I just want to take out this video and split it into two discussions, AWS Lambda and EC2, which can be further extended into serverless versus a server full in a way compute. And which one should you choose? choose and why. So at our work on Fermion and CodeDAM both, we use a mix of serverless and serverful environments based on our usage patterns and what we need for that specific thing. So just to give you an example of a few things, for example, if I go to this one website, which is of a website of a content creator who's using Fermion to host his Web3 course, all these backend calls which you're seeing, for example, if I open this live class, for example, this live streaming, when it starts, it's getting that access token and everything from a backend call, right? So this streaming happens through other services, sure. But this chat, for example, everything, this is happening through a backend call. And for backend, we use AWS Lambdas, right? So I'll just create AWS Lambda as a section. So less here, and I will create, let's say, a section here, EC2, which is sort of like serverful. So you can sort of like consider serverless as AWS Lambda or maybe Cloudflare Workers or anything which you want. And EC2 can be consider considered as metal or, you know, bare bone servers, any other provider also, that's also fine. So how this works, for example, this is all of this whole page gets loaded in a serverless environment, right? So backend calls is serverless, everything is serverless. Then when, do, when you come to something like a coding lab, where you have to create a smart contract or where you have to create or solve a specific coding lab in this course, this environment works in a server full fashion, right? So this server over here, it's an actual real server that's running somewhere in the cloud and we connect to it. So you can't use AWS Lambda here. You, I mean, you can use, but then there are problems with that. So I'll discuss that also. That is again one. A few internal services that we use uses EC2 because of their long running nature, right? So let's discuss about when, do you, when should you use AWS Lambda, when should you use EC2 and all the good things about that. So first of all, let's try to understand the cost right? So excluding the data transfer costs, we are not discussing that here, but exclu excluding that, if you go ahead and look at AWS Lambda cost, you'll find that it's extremely cheap when you start to look at it. Yeah. So let's say for the sake of this argument, we are going with x86 pricing. So you have 20 cents per million request, and then this amount for every GB second, right? Of execution. It doesn't matter if you're doing IO or CPU, it, you will be charged for that. So let's take a look at this example. For example, over here, you can see that if you have have a mobile application with all these parameters, for example, let's assume that your application processes 3 million requests per month. So 3 million requests per month is effectively around 100,000 requests a day, right? So 100,000 requests a day effectively is about, about 4,000 requests an hour. And 4,000 requests an hour is about like 60 requests a minute, right? Which corresponds to like one request per second. So it's it's like a decent assumption, right? So you see over here that your charge for something like this comes out to be total charge of 2.73 US dollars a month, right? So even if you are at a scale of, let's say one request per second, your cost sort of with Lambda. So again, I'm not scaling down this example or doing any of that. I'm just taking this part as it is. So this comes out to be 2.73 per month, right? For a one request per second thing. Now for an EC2 instance, this would be, this can, any instance can handle this sort of thing, right? One request per second. So if average function duration is 120 millisecond, I'm assuming that not a lot of work is going on because if you also have a database or something around that here, that would anyway like block a lot of time. So EC2 pricing, right? Let's take a look at that. So over here, if I explore like T4G or EC2, even T3 as an instance. So you'll see that you you get like two vCPUs and a memory of 512. But if let's say if you just go with the 2 GB RAM one, because here also in the Lambda itself, you were going with 1536 MB. So I'll rather choose this one website. It at least shows things clearly. So T3 Nano, for example, T3 Small, let's say. So this comes out to be how much? On demand is 0 0.028 per hour, right? So that comes out to be 24 hours. And then in 30 days, it's like $15, right? Now again, not an apples to apples comparison. You can probably choose another instance and get the price down to like $3, $4. But you can see that on your one request per second scale, on average, Lambda is this. The problem here happens when you start to scale 
scale it up, right? So now let's say if you have 100 requests per second, you suddenly grew your usage either by 100 times or you just added a few more features like analytics or something that requires you to scale this up. Now this is growing with you, right? So it automatically jumped to $273 a month. But here, over here, what's going to happen is that it's not going to grow as fast as you would think because over here, you are not running, first of all, you are not running at 100% CPU capacity, right? With one request per second also. But here it doesn't matter because every request is an individual request for AWS Lambda. Second thing is that here, this would not be $273 a month. This would hardly be like 50 or maybe like $100 a month maximum. And even if you look at providers like Hertzner, so if you go to like a provider like Hertzner and if you go to like a dedicated server, for example, for 50 euros or 44 euros, for example, per month, you are getting a six core, 64 GB RAM and one terabyte of SSD for 50 euros a month, right? Around 50 euros a month. And this itself is a beast machine, right? You can do so much more than this on this machine itself. So at scale, like at a huge scale, it makes sense for you to just opt in for EC2 because of the cost savings alone. But again, like for a lot of people, what happens is that this $273 is also not a very pinching point because at, at a scale where you're doing like 100 requests per second on average, you're probably making a lot more money from your business, you know, for this to uh, worry you. So this is one. Second thing, which is here, uh, which we also discussed in this last video, scaling to 10,000 plus Postgres connections, is that you almost always will need a bouncer. You almost always will need a bouncer, right? A database bouncer, a PG bouncer, basically. So in talking in terms of like Postgres. In this case, you might not, might not need it right away, right? Because what happens in EC2 instance, like I showed you this massive server, even if you create two of these servers, right? Who are handling like 200 requests per second, let's say each of them, it still doesn't need a bouncer because you can have a pool of connection, which we discussed in the last video, where each of this instance is connecting like 200, 200 connections to Postgres, dedicated connections, and they are just handling everything. So in, in that sense, it is simple. It seems like it is simple to deploy and all, but there are, of course, there are more things which I'll talk about in now. So you don't need a bouncer as such right away because your EC2 instance itself is like, you know, it's there, right? So it's just two points of contacts, which the database has to establish. Uh, you have to establish connections with database and that's it. So I'll just start to label winners in each category, right? So in this category, this is the winner. In the scale up category, EC2s is a winner. In AWS Lambda, in this PG bouncer category, I'll still say that EC2 is a winner because, you know, obviously better to not have like a complexity part in your system. But here, over here, the, so let's, let's keep it this first. The hardware, underlying hardware, underlying hardware is not your responsibility, right? So when I say underlying hardware, I don't really mean like the full hardware, the bare metal, but still like the software or the environment in which it is running. Over here, this is your responsibility, right? So if you're buying a dedicated server from Hertzner, you know, one of those days I was seeing a tweet on Twitter where somebody mentioned that my Hertzner server is not running and the support replied back that your power cord of the server got disabled connected. So we have connected it back. You should be able to access the server again. So those kinds of things are not possible in AWS Lambda, right? Because this is like an ephemeral environment by definition. It will be created somewhere, you know, you would not even know where it is running as a code. So it's not your responsibility at all. Over here, any mishap or anything that happens, even on your EC2 instance is your responsibility, right? So what happens a lot of times is that, for example, in case of EC2s also, what happens is that because EC2s as machines are also running on some hardware, right? Right? A lot of times what you will see is that AWS emails you, this has happened with us, that you have to like restart your instance or you have to shut it off or, you know, just change it to some other instance because we want to replace the underlying hardware. We want to change the underlying hardware. Something has happened, like they want to reboot the big metal machine or something has happened. Then in that case, it's not like you just create an EC2 instance and forget about it. So that's number one. So you can do that pretty much with Lambda. You can just create a Lambda and forget about it. It'll just keep on working forever. Not so much with EC2 instance. So what happens over here is that logging, for example, is free. Free as in like free of headache basically. Over here, you have to make sure that disk doesn't explode 
with data, right? So you don't want to you don't want to run in a situation where your EC2 instance is out of storage, right? And it can really happen. It has happened more than one time with me personally when I'm managing something on my own. Is that the log slowly keeps on piling up, up, up? It becomes like multiple gigabytes in size, and it just you know at that point the EC2 becomes unresponsive. So that is not there. Number one, compute is free of headache. So for example, let's say you did something really bad. For example, let's say you tried to open a lot of files and your file descriptor count is like exhausted or something has happened, right? So compute level thing has broken, like something weird has happened. So these environments are sandbox, right? So they are like, they're created and they're destroyed. Not so much here, unless you are using virtualization technologies like Docker or Firecracker on your own. So compute should be managed, right? So, I mean, you can't just not keep a monitor on these. So you can't have an arrangement where, you know, you are not monitoring your EC2 instances at all, right? That cannot be, that that's not a good choice. Third thing, which I know in case of Lambda, this is not like hardware specific, so I'll just create a new point. Versioning is included, right? Which is a, another amazing thing, which I don't think a lot of people talk about. Versioning must be done manually, right? So here Lambda wins and here EC2 wins, here also Lambda wins. So versioning, what I mean by versioning is, for example, if you have seen these providers like Vercel and you know Cloudflare workers also now support uh, rollback and all of that, all of that is also possible in AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda works on the versioning model only like the dollar latest version points to the latest lambda and then you can just revert the lambda back to point to some other version so all of that is included by default and it's very convenient we use it at, at our side and you can use that to you know not only just promote the versions conditionally but also in case something has happened you can just quickly revert back the version over ec2 not so much because you know because this is like your own dedicated stuff so you have to like you know if you, if you have like these two machines you would have to create some sort sort of set up on your own. So maybe like creating Docker containers, which contain every version on their own. And then you just somehow switch it with some reverse proxy or something like that. So it has to be done on your own, right? So there's a cost you have to pay the cost, which you're saving over here, for example, you have to somehow like, you know, pay that in terms of your time or the engineering efforts or something around that. So serverless versus serverful fights in general are a battle of these costs only, right? Because the serverless provider is doing so much for you out of the box that that is why they charge you for that specific thing. If you feel that you have a talented team which works for less pricing than what you are paying in a serverless environment, then of course you should do that. And by definition, because this cost just keeps on growing, for every workload, for every possible workload, there is an inflection point where serverless doesn't make any sense. Then you have to switch to serverful for cost saving. You just have to figure out what that point is in your journey. If you have not arrived at that point, then chances are that you should just keep on using serverless as a technology. Once you get to that specific point where the ease of of the service is costing you much more than the time you can just spend and engineering efforts and hire somebody to do that, then you should be shifting to serverful environment, right? So in our case, for example, just to answer this question, why we are not doing this on an EC2 environment, we can do it, yes, but it's not worth all these things which we have right now to recreate it in somehow in some fashion by our own engineering efforts. We can do it, maybe we can spend a week, a couple of weeks and get the similar results, but the savings for us would not be huge right now, right? So it would not be worth it. Most certainly we will need that at some point as we keep on growing. I don't know where we are in terms of this number right now. I'm not sure, but it should be like 10 or 15 right now. I'm saying this based on the based on the bills we get. I mean, I'm not really sure. I think the last time I checked our Lambda bill was around 100, 100, 120 a month. So I'm assuming like it's close to, because we also don't use a one and a half GB instance. We use like a slightly smaller one GB instance. And because it's still like I'm not sure like it should be like around 50 to 70 requests a second I don't know should be something around that so anyway that's that's basically it a few more things of course monitoring is also out of the box so you have like monitoring stats out of the box where there you have to like set up Prometheus or something around that monitoring is manual right and another thing which I can think of real quick is that deployment is a breeze. So there is no downtime as such when you're using AWS Lambda, right? Over here, you have to make sure zero, zero downtime deployments, 
must be done carefully right like i mentioned over here you have this versioning so you can just create a version check if everything is fine and then just may mark it as production and any customer who's already like running a backend call they will still be running that backend call right over here you will have to drain those connections manually so you don't want to like suddenly shut off connections who are already talking with the backend so you can't just remove your container and then directly ins install a new container so you want to have like some level of architecture here where you support like zero downtime deployment Again, all of this, I'm not saying this is not doable. All of this is doable. The only thing is that does it match or does it, is it required at this point? That's, that's the fundamental question which you should be taking as a business owner. But yeah, so when you develop things like this on your own, this is all of the things which you have to worry about. So if you are somebody who's like trying to create a platform of your own, where you can sell courses, you can teach people, you can conduct live classes, recorded courses, all of that. That is why we are making Fermion because all of these technical challenges, we will take care on your behalf so when the scale is huge we will automatically make this shift from here to here we'll make sure the systems are reliable while you can focus on the content and you can focus on the marketing of that product so segregation of responsibilities again just like what aws is doing with us and maybe like ec2 and hertzner also is doing with us they take care of the real hardware so they are taking the you know they are buying the hardware they're installing it in the racks they are providing us with these services we are going one layer above on in terms of abstraction action is that we are going one layer on top of it and we are telling you that okay you don't need to do all of this as a business owner as somebody who is a content creator for example and you want to create these courses you don't have to do all of this focus on building your business and the content side of things and let the tech handled by us who can help you accelerate your time to market basically because that's that's the biggest thing right if you start today you can probably develop a platform but it will cost you like lakhs of rupees or thousands of dollars in salaries time of six months twelve months whatever and then also it's not guaranteed if the product is really good if it's really polished really finished that we can bring all these guarantees we can bring with for on so do check it out if you are a content creator yourself or if you're somebody who's trying to get into content creation space that's all for this one hopefully you learned something new let me know what you think about this i'll see you in the next video really soon